Hello, welcome to Screen Talk, a series of discussions that were filmed last year delving into the workings of film and television. We speak to some location managers, directors, producers, actors, film financiers about the workings of film and TV and gain some valuable insight into the industry. I hope you enjoy the series. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give a big Bradford warm welcome to Jamie Sumner, Jonathan Davis and Leon Seth. <laughs> Summing up, what is a location manager? When you think of a film set, all the questions that people come up with that no one really knows who to go with, um, that ends up being aimed at the location manager. Can we do that? Can we go there? Are we allowed to do this? Things like that, we tend to, tend to be asked them. But in brief, we find the locations that we want to film at. We make sure that we are able to film there. Uh, we organise the facilita facilitation of filming there, uh, the parking, and creating a base somewhere nearby uh, where we can do our costume, makeup, catering, changes for all the actors. Um, and that's about it. Then we make sure that the locations are happy with us after we've left as well. Okay. I'll come back to you in a minute. Jonathan, how do you start out doing this? I mean, wh when did you start and how did you start? Well, I started um, sort of in the industry. I started in 1999. So it's 20, been 20 years this year. But that was starting right at the bottom. You must so have been 10, uh, were you, when you started? Yeah. 12. Um, I, I started as a, an art department assistant in 1999 on a, on a film for low-budget feature called uh, This Filthy Earth and I was driving a van, never driven in a van before and then I got offered a job as a runner on a ITV, a Yorkshire TV production called Macorba. Realised quite quickly I didn't want to work with the actors so um, I got offered um, the opportunity of being a location assistant on uh, Where the Heart Is in Huddersfield oh, yeah. back in the day. And um, because the guy was a location assistant, he'd moved up to what is the next rung of the ladder as a unit manager. So that was I just I just said yes straight away to just to get out of working um, directly with the actors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, but uh, but uh, and then location assisted probably for about five or six years, just learning everything from you know just just the fact that you're on you're on set all the time um, in lots of different scenarios, you stood in the rain for 12 hours a day, yeah. you know. It's not pretty, it's is it? It's not pretty, it's not glamorous, you know. You're talking 70, 80 hour weeks, uh, and then um, and then you move up, hopefully somebody offers you a job as a unit manager, which is the next step up, if they think you're ready, and then did that for five, six years, and then location managed now for about five. So those, are the, those are the sort of steps. That adds that, up, does that add up? Yeah, yeah. well it kind of <laughs> does add up, yeah, no, it's good, it's, yeah. good. it's a good point in history. Give or and take a year. Leon, what about you? Is it something that you studied to do? Did you do film or TV at uni or it, how did you get into it? Locations is a really odd, odd job uh, because uh, uh, there is no award category for locations. You know, every other discipline from camera, sound, art, design uh, has some kind of recognition. But the work I guess all of us do lays the foundation for on which everything else is built. So without a, a location, you can't have an art department go in and dress it, or you can't have you know camera come in and, and film some some pretty pictures, basically. So the work all of us do in finding locations and then doing logistics is is kind of the bedrock on which everything else is built. Yet only we know that we do it, and our partners really. Um, <laughs> but it's one of the, because there is no like, no not in my case <laughs> just in general steady yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a litany of relationship um, but I think in terms of training I think it's a certain kind of eclectic character that ends up being in locations because well that's my next question what's the key attributes to being a location I, manager I apart mean, from a lot of patience I, I, I tenacity think, I think location <laughs> being a location manager it kind of chooses you rather than you it necessarily mm. because I think most people get into film and TV and want to be a producer director or writer you know one of the more glamorous uh, jobs and um, I mean, I studied law, I worked in art galleries, I know Jamie was a forensic scientist, lots of people were, were you know, surveyors, architects, come from uh, the armed forces. Yeah. So mm. there's a whole range of backgrounds, but at essence, 
you're a, a you know you communicate with people well mm. and you get on with people well and you problem solve quickly yeah. um, so I mean I literally I didn't know what a location manager was I wanted to be a documentary maker and uh, someone we all know a chap called Richard Knight who now works at the Screen Yorkshire he co-opted me and uh, and gave me some work experience in locations and then that mm. that was literally a taster and uh, and it just kind of stuck. So I'm kind of doing what he was doing when he kind of, yeah, it's bizarre. Would you agree with that, those kind of key attributes? Absolutely. The, 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 the key bit there uh, is, is the being able to get on with people from every walk of life. Because mm -hmm. you could be sent out to find a stately home or, as you were saying earlier, a castle or whatever it may a be. A sweet shop. Yeah. Anything. Or, yeah. or, or you could Form be going box. to uh, a council estate and you have to get everyone from the council estate on board. You have to get all the local community together and get everyone excited about the film work. It's about getting the community involved or wherever it is that you're hoping to film involved and excited about what you're doing. And it's a developing thing. So, I mean, like, you know, when you first start out, you, learn, you quickly learn from your mistakes. Yeah. You know, the first few people that you upset or you do things wrong, you realise, I'm not going to do that again. Yeah, yeah. So you learn ways of talking to people and, you know, you know that, for example, like a stately home, you can drive down, a, you just drive down a drive and just eventually get to stately home and think, right, OK, I'm just going to go and knock on this door and see who answers it. And hopefully it'll be somebody who is willing to speak to you. And I think it's just a way of presenting yourself. You know, you'll have an opening line of like, you know, my opening line generally is when I knock is I'm not selling anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and then you kind of disarm people yeah, as well. Yeah. You explain, yeah. you have to quickly explain what you're doing in a, in a sentence. Otherwise, they're just, they're just uh, you know, they'll just shut the door in your face. Or, yeah. you know. Do you get turned down a lot then? Or are most people mm. sort of like, oh, they want to make a film or a TV show in my house or on my street? You have to earn people's trust. And I think you as you are as a person, you have to open yourself up immediately. So you're kind of, uh, you know, they, they see who you are, that you're trustworthy, you're non-threatening. You're asking them a very strange thing that they're not expecting you to ask, like, you know, I'm trying to find this. Uh, would you, would I be able to, you know, come in? So within the space of a few minutes, you can meet someone for the first time and be in the private spaces taking pictures. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a really, <clears throat> It's a really strange thing, and you do fall into that kind of nuisance caller at the door, and yeah. you know. Yeah. So you've got to immediately ride over that. Yeah. But by being kind of open and just as like, you get you know, you need to s connect with people very sure. quickly and make them yeah. see that you are true in what you're saying. It's finding yeah. common ground really quickly with somebody. Yeah. You can look. You go in somebody's house. You look around and you see something. You think. Oh, I've got one of those. Oh, I, oh, you like that kind of music, and you just start yeah. the conversation going. <laughs> These Comple are very good tips out completely there, avoid <laughs> like, anything to do with filming, and you can just say, oh, "I'm doing this thing." And I said, "Do you know anybody who's got um, a, back to, a, a terraced house that looks a bit like it looks a bit like yours, actually?" But <laughs> I don't suppose you'd be interested. But do you know anybody else uh, uh, in the street you think can be be interested? Any family and. Uh, and often that come they end up filming at their house because they've kind of you disarmed them and yeah, yeah. you know you could be like talking that. about disarmed anything else. Them, yeah. And money does money, I suppose money does come into it, doesn't it? Right at the end. Right at the end. So and you only when you're not knocking it. on the door and saying we're going to give you three hundred pound a day to use your house. See, what? see, I, 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 I kind of not lead with it, but within the first few sentences, along with the, I'm not selling you anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's the the idea of. Um, we, we'd like to come and we'll, we'll pay you to be mm. here. You, you're not, you, when, I'm not trying to sell you anything. You don't have to buy anything from me. This isn't a Ponzi scheme. This is something where we will pay you for the pleasure of being in your home. You're giving us this, uh, this uh, honor of being, of being able to use your property. I, I mean, there's a, there's a huge amount of trust going into someone's house. I mean, and it's our job, and I've said this, I've been ridiculed for it, but it's true. We manage between the real world and the film world, so mm. we manage that relationship. So we are the focal point. So behind us, uh, uh, there's an iceberg, and we're at the pinnacle. So we're the first pe person anyone will ever meet, potentially, mm. to do the filming. But behind us, there's a big fat behind of a film crew, all with their own jobs and all wanting to kind of go into someone's house and film it like a film set. So based on the relationships we build from the outset, and the trust that they have in us as people, we then have to have their back as well as the production's kind of agenda in terms of helping them get the you know, 
great scenes, but also this looking after the location and the location owner and all the people around so that they within an instant will have us back again because yeah. we might have to go back for uh, reshoots or kind of or another production will come after us and I know certainly because Bradford is a real hotbed of activity if one production doesn't you know kind of keep to the same standards you get tired with the same brush it's like mm. oh you're mm. the film people when every production is different with a whole different set of uh, yeah. Objective. So yeah. Yeah, and partly, I mean, I should have said at the start. Part part of my role is to manage the work of the film office in Bradford with with uh, with Rachel, who's um, operating the, the the sound at the back there because we are multitaskers. Um, but so we we work with these guys very very closely to manage the relationship between the city, and the locations and the and the productions and and it is such a fine balance of because people all remember when things go wrong. You know, mm. when that dumper truck turned up at five in the morning instead of <laughs> six thirty, when that Yorkshire <coughs> stone was drilled into uh, set dresses, uh, you know, when selfish giant Jonathan, I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say it probably wouldn't have happened without you and I pushing that yeah, agenda yeah. Well, in yeah. Bradford. Yeah. So, well, it, it leads me on to my next question. Really, it, can you talk briefly? I mean, we don't need to warts and all, but are there scenarios when things have actually gone kind of badly wrong, and you think, oh no? <laughs> I mean, I know you guys very well and that you, f you are really good at fixing things, but is there a scenario where you thought that well, this is, you know... The worst one, as, as simple as it sounds, we had, we had a run of things go wrong at a place called Newby Hall, um, which started with someone on the crew, unbeknownst to me or the rest of the crew, apparently, uh, knocking this antique ornate plate that had been left off a side. But then instead of telling the locations crew who would have sorted it out, gone and spoken to the house and said, look, an accident's happened, they shoved it underneath the side <laughs> with their foot <laughs> and just hid it from, from view. And so at the end of the day, we do a walk around with the location owners yep. to say, all right, is everything OK? Are you happy with how we've left the place? And as I was saying those words, they noticed this broken plate sticking out from underneath this side. <laughs> And they weren't ballistic. They were. They, they just. It's. It's a situation that could be avo avoided. Yeah, yeah. With active people in the crew saying, "I've made a mistake." A bit of honesty. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah. and you can fix that. But the the trust that is damaged by someone doing something like that, it it, it tars it tars the rest of the crew. Mm. Um, and then the next day we put a scaffold pole through one of the windows yeah. and they would have re reacted a, a lot worse to yeah. that than they would have done if we'd have been up yeah. in the first place. And it's understandable, the broken window thing, I mean, just to come back to Leon's other point, you know, the, that tip of the iceberg, if you're not familiar with a TV drama set, something like Peaky Blinders, I'm sure everyone's aware of Peaky Blinders, yeah? They had one star, one piece of talent, one person on set and there were literally 60 people to service that shoot in City Hall. You know, mm. that's what it's like with these high-end TV dramas that all these have worked on. Then when you start to talk feature films, it's kind of, you're talking about up to 100 people <laughs> that yeah. are all swarming about with cables and stepladders and scaffold poles. Official Secrets, which will come out in, the, in, in October, filmed in City Hall, that, that was one, uh, which stars Keira Knightley, it's about the whistleblower from GCHQ. They broke a window, but it wasn't just any window. It was a Victorian sash window in City Hall that had been painted shut oh. for quite a few years. But the art department, uh, actually the, the, the riggers, had forced it and they'd, they'd smashed yeah. these windows. So it needed rebuilding. In fact, it, it turned out to be a bonus because they could, the, the people in the office could then open and close it. But we had to get a specialist carpenter <laughs> in to, to replace this Victorian sash window. And I mean, they did come clean. And I was able to, you know, do that little bit in between, sort of like, it's going to be better. It's going to be better than it was. <laughs> and they were saying, yeah, but this is a grade one listed building. <laughs> Have you had anything go wrong apart from drilling into the Yorkshire Stone in Little Germany uh, uh, for Utopia? <laughs> I think it was, uh, wasn't you, it? You personally drill it. to point, it, point it, fingers. I, I did not have the drill. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I was trying to... There's lots, lots of little niggles. I mean... I, I remember, for some reason, we had a, we had a motorbike into a Grade One listed building, and uh, and to, it, w it had been lifted in, but for some reason, when it was coming out, the guy whose motorbike it was decided to ride it down <laughs> the stairs, <coughs> leaving. It sounds like a Bollywood film. It was just like, <laughs> what are you doing? Do you know what I mean? It's kind of 
he just thought it was, and it, it left it left a mark in the stone. It's like, so sometimes you, you deal with abject idiocy, uh, and you can't you can't. <laughs> You can't legislate for it. It's kind of having little children and turn your back for like oh, two minutes. And you turn like around, you find something ridiculous is going on. You know, uh, one for me was filming at Bramham Park for a syndicate, and um, lovely people that own Bramham Park. It's a privately owned estate, you know, and it's you know it's great great people that own it. You know, landed gentry, da da da, very you know, and um, the man of the house is very proud of the. He's got like a wildflower flower meadow at the back of the. Um, the hall, <coughs> to the untrained eye, just look, especially in winter, just looks like a grass, gr grassy field. And um, I had said to Kay Mellor, I'd said, whatever you do, that tractor is not going to, cannot go on the grass, it's got to stay on this gravel path. And part of the action was Lenny Henry was supposed to drive this tractor and as part of the action because he was like the groundsman. And I just went off to talk to somebody for two minutes. I came back, and the guy from the house who was well, working for the guy in the house came, ashen face, looking at me, going, he said, and I looked, and Lenny Henry was on the grass, driving this tractor right across the grass. Oh. And I could, looked at a little window in the hall. I could see the man, the, the man of the house looking down like that, looking out like that, with this really angry look on his face. So then I had to go and... Uh, smooth things over and say but he won't do it again. I guess, but then he realised it was Lenny Henry and it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. It's, it, like I said, it's all that good work and then something like that that's, you know, I remember <laughs> not, not to mention a Yorkshire soap that used to have the word farm in it <laughs> that were filming up at the Cow and Calf Rocks and they, they did a similar thing. It's an area of special scientific interest up there and they wanted to take a land rover. It wasn't you, was it? Oh, it's a few no, years ago, wasn't it? It's, it's a couple of years it's ago. It's all about then. crashing. A, there was a scene anyway. Yes. And, and it... And it it wasn't how it was described because I think the special effects people in the art department got a little bit carried away. And it is about, it's about communication, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I suppose from your point of view, making sure that them lot, this iceberg, know what you've agreed yeah, and yes. what the parameters are. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, that, it's that division between trying to make the thing that you're trying to do not impossible or unsurmountable, where yeah. you're not going to barge in with a hundred people, completely trash a house and then leave it. It's, it's trying to make the thing that you're hoping to do uh, something that's possible, but at the same time actually describing what they're going to do. Because if, if it's, it's that time when you cut corners or you don't tell them what's happening, yeah. that's when people start to get really upset. But I always know when you guys ring me up and you go, how are you doing? And I go, I'm fine. <laughs> And then there's a pause, <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of like, what do you want? And then there's either a cough like that, or there's a little laugh. Well, the <laughs> thing is, <laughs> and then this big scheme comes out, and it's so regulated, the industry is so regulated, isn't it, and insured mm -hmm. to the hilt, in case anyone trips over that bit of wire or whatever. Yeah, just tripping over a cable, I mean, that's, you know, that's as basic as it gets. You film in a public area, like a street, mm. everything has to be risk assessed. You've got to have public liability insurance, you know, and you know everything's got to be signed off before you do it. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you know, you're talking big trouble. Yeah. No. So um, bring, bringing it back to Bradford, then, have you? I mean, what's your experience of Bradford? <laughs> of course, you're going to say it's a good experience. I would hope, anyway. <laughs> but do you have a particular, uh, uh, you know, a particular favourite location, or do you think we're untapped? I mean, I, I, I certainly think places like Saltaire, maybe Little Germany's been done a little bit too much this mm. last year. <laughs> but it's, it's one of those things that I think, because Bradford has David, I mean, it, it makes the city so much more film accessible and film friendly because there aren't many people who are such advocates. And that's not to beg you up, no. it genuinely is. No. Um, it, it helps the process. Uh, and without someone like that, where is your entry point? Do you know what I mean? It's very much more disparate and, and spread out. So having someone who I can phone David and, and apologetically say, you know, I'm working to a crazy time frame. I need to speak, or this is my problem, can you help me solve it? And David, mm -hmm. within like five minutes, can connect me to the right person. Because we're always problem solving and there's always asks and pressures. Um, but in terms of in Bradford, I guess, you're right, Little Germany has been shot, but it's been shot because it's so good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. and, and location, it's a small kind of grouping and people talk and good locations get out there and, and now the London lot know very much that Little Germany is kind of a great place for period drama and, 
and not just period trauma as well. So I mean, mm. I mean, I guess that's where we've probably all been most recently. I mean, I was there twice you were. last year, so yeah. we did a big BBC drama that's about to come out called Gentleman Jack with Soren Jones, uh, and we also did Downton Abbey there as well. So did a big set piece, which was a which was a full-on kind of takeover of Little Germany in terms of all the street lights pulling out kind of road signs and, and all sorts. Really. We literally so. pulled out a road sign. So normally they'll say, can we take the no entry sign, the give way sign down, and they'll leave the pole and they'll mask it with something. But with Downton Abbey, they went, no, we want the whole thing out, the concrete and everything. But, and then they put it back again, didn't they? But was, yes. that, was that your toughest number so far? I, I mean, that, that was incredibly complicated just because there are so many elements. There's yeah. so many businesses and residents and, and people you have to have consideration of. You can't just, when you're dealing with someone's interior house, you know, it, you're dealing with one person. Dealing with everyone is kind of, you know, deliveries, mm. kind of whatever everyone's stresses and strains are. So yeah, that that was that was really complicated because you don't realise how much stuff goes on no. in a normal street in a twenty-four hour period, do you? Oh, Until you actually right. stand there and go, you know, we're going to be filming here, and you suddenly realise there are all these problems that to be solved. Cars mainly. Yeah, yeah any, any any modernity or anything like if you're doing period drama, it's cars, satellite dishes you know, uh, drain pipes that don't, don't match, uh, anything from, you know, just, just so many things, you start looking and you think, there's a lot of stuff here that needs <laughs> changing. It can, it can be the incidental things, like, yeah. so it's all those things, but then also people's windows. And if it's a block of flats, and they want to kind of have lights on or kind of drapes, yeah. you need to befriend every one of those people on that side of the building and kind of mm. have, you know, and in a moment's notice be able to get in. Maybe they want a top shot out of one of the windows or mm. kind of to build a lighting tower right in front and we're going to do it at night so there's a generator that's going to be running next <laughs> to the building. <laughs> so, I mean, do you know what I mean? Right. Sorry. The customer might, be, they might, they might, they might say, okay, we want lights in that window, that window, that window, that window. They can't just be their lights, it has to be our lights. Yes. It has to be the electrician's lights. So we have to go into their flats, rig a light in one flat and then do it another five times then call them up whenever it needs to go off, whenever it needs to go on. Yep. At the end of night, we need to go in, take it all out. 10 o'clock at night, we finally get out of there. And the majority of places we go to, they all love it. Yes. Yeah, no, <laughs> That's good, good that they love good. it. But it's down, I think it's partly, <clears throat> well, massively down to the way that you guys deal with people. And I've seen it. I've seen it where people have come in really angry and gone away smiley happy. And it is, it's a testament <laughs> to your <laughs> skills <laughs> of whatever you said. What did you say about disarming people? Oh yeah, it's disarming a, it's a people. Ninja. It's a ninja skill with a location <laughs> manager. I, I, I had one where um, <clears throat> I was sent out scouting and uh, they said, oh, what was it? They said they, they wanted these beautiful vistas uh, up around the North Yorkshire Moors and the cliff edges and these beautiful dog walks and fields and sheep. And I spent two days up there scouting uh, sent off these photos and I was really, fr like I'd been literally running up hills taking photos and then running back down to my car, driving down to the next place, running up the next hill, taking a load of photos, running back down again. And they said, they're nice, but really we wanted to see some farms. <laughs> <laughs> but you sent me out to look for vistas and like, yeah, but now we want to see farms instead. <laughs> that's it, that's it. <laughs> It, it's a really tricky one because the, there's there's two very distinct aspects to our job and at the outset it's the scouting mm. and you're dealing directly with those who have the vision so it's usually the director and producer isn't it so yeah. you're, you're trying to just based on what they say find uh, you know interpret what they're telling you whether it be a landscape or, or a farm or you know they've maybe not communicated it effectively enough but you need to get from them what they want and then in quite a short space of time find it but it yeah it's, it's a challenge when you're being pulled in different directions like I've I've found like when we did Ut Utopia um, the brief went from uh, uh, terraced houses so I kind of I've been in and it was very particular so I, I was in at least a dozen options on, on terraced houses and having seen those he then said no maybe more like a a loft style apartment and it's like <laughs> you know I'd, it, 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 it was, I'd, but I'd been in and kind of because you're the first point and the first person anyone meets each one of those 12 houses mm. I'd kind of given a lot of my time to to lay the foundation and that initial trust mm. so that if they chose them we could go in so it's not like you know it's just an option you yeah. put a lot of work in just to making that one live option mm. so it's a it's a right 
boring. We, we, we had one when we were doing Dad's Army, um, where they, they said, right, we want a, we want a cottage. It needs to be single pane glass. It needs to be old because it's turn of the century. It needs to be this old cottage overlooking the sea on a hill. You're like, right, okay. Showed them this one that we found pretty early on um, up in the North Yorkshire Moors. And they're like, nah, it doesn't work. It's too <laughs> small. Um, we then spent three weeks uh, of three different scouts all looking simultaneously across the North Yorkshire Moors down to Flamborough, Bridlington, everywhere, all over the area. Three weeks later, they see this picture of this little house and they say, that's perfect. That's exactly what we want. Where you it was started. the first house <laughs> that we'd gone to and we gave <coughs> We'd, we'd spent three mm. weeks yeah. of budget. <laughs> There's so much psychology involved in that. It's yeah, like yeah. You, you can find you find the perfect location and you know you've nailed it, you've got it the first time, <laughs> and you send those photographs to the director and the producer and you go, they're going to come back and say, brilliant, spot on. And they'll come back and say, more options, please, more <laughs> options. And I actually know location managers, I don't know if you three do it, but who hold back the gems a little. They're like, I, I know that he's, because they'll know the director mm. so well yeah. that I'm going to give him this farmhouse, but I know he wants stables at the back, so I'll keep that in my pocket mm. until he comes back and goes, where's the stables? I'll go out and look again. I wonder what would happen if we got some directors in the same chairs <laughs> and asked them a question about location managers. I remember foot and mouth was a bit of an issue with quite a few things back in the day. That, that, that made, meant so many places you couldn't film, so you had to mm. change things at the last minute. And often, like, like current events that happen or you know something happened news or locally that you have to be really sometimes scripts have to be rewritten because something's happened I mm. think so on Ackley Bridge series one um, we filmed a scene where and it was um, quite early on in the series was when so I don't know if you know the series but it's supposedly like a secondary school that's been formed by two other schools being closed down one's predominantly Asian one's predominantly white working class and they join together um, and there's one lad character in it who decided to run into school wearing like a suicide bomber's vest as a joke as part of the scene. And that scene was never shown because literally it was, it was going to go out the week after the Manchester Arena mm. attack. So they had to basically, long after we'd even finished filming the series, literally like two months later, they had to co re completely rewrite that part of the script and <coughs> re reshoot something completely different that had no no relevance to that or no, no, ref no reference to it at all because that's quite often what happens. And sometimes you're filming somewhere where th a natural police incident happens and you mm. have to kind of to stop the filming or you have to move on. Yeah. You know, I don't know if that's happened to you, but... It's, 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 one, it's one of those where like, if, if there's a police incident, it's, it's one way you either have to relocate to a different sort of area, try and mm. be nice to the people that are involved, try, try and keep everyone happy and keep everything moving, because obviously that takes precedent over anything that we're doing. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, disasters, that one that I was talking to you before about where I went down, and they're like, oh, if we've got the first location sorted out, it's fine, it's a school, all signed off, it's all fine, uh, for this little feature film I did down south. Uh, rocked up. Did a bit of scouting, chatted to the school, speaking to them for a week, it was all fine. Friday, I put the contract in front of them, they're like, can't, can't sign a contract. We need to send this to our legal team. Sent it off to the legal team, the legal team sent it off to the council, and the council said, you're having filming. You haven't told us you're a school, and you're having <laughs> filming. You shouldn't part of your school, and you haven't told us. And cancelled the filming that was happened. This was 5 p.m. on a Friday night. Filming was commencing on Monday at 7 a.m. Oh. No locations, nothing else lined up for those that, that day, and we were there for a week. So our first entire oh, week word. was in this wow. school, and filming got cancelled the Friday before it. And we, everyone's been working for months up until that point, uh, and weeks up until that point. And I, as the location manager, I was told that it was all sorted, but uh, you mm. go in and you find that things haven't been organised correctly because they haven't had the budget to bring in a location manager earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but we, in, in that event, we ended up, all of us on the production team and myself were throughout the weekend finding locations and rewriting scripts and reorganising the production so that on the Monday we went and shot, and the Tuesday we went and shot completely different scenes that we were going to be filming there and reorganised all the filming for later on in the week. And in the meantime, on the Monday, Tuesday, I went to the council, had to organise with them that we were going to go and film in the school and get the permissions and get the contract signed. 
it becomes quite a bit of a nightmare when things like that go wrong. I mean, the whole thing is a learning experience. Every single job you get tested in a different way and it, it's an accumulated knowledge because in location, yeah, there isn't a course that you study necessarily as a, as a location manager. You know, you can do courses in different things. I think the National Film and Television School have something now, but I mean, that's really expensive. So, I mean, it's all accumulated knowledge along the way. So, in, I mean... I think you're your own worst you're your own worst critic in a way that mm. you you always you know you'll go back to an office and you go why why did that happen like why did that turn out that yeah. way is there a way I can do that differently next time or is it just take it on the chin just move on and just and I think you kind of it's like osmosis you kind of absorb these experiences and you become thick skinned as well because you kind of next time something similar happens you can kind of you can kind of ride the storm ride the wave can't you kind yeah. of go especially if it's to do with like producers and directors and people who are in that bubble, it only, I, only ever, I only ever really get um, sort of, not upset, but I always normally get kind of uh, disturbed when I've, or when I've annoyed or I've upset a member of the public. Yeah. Not through anything I've done, but something the the crew have done, and I will, I will go <coughs> down there straight away and I'll be honest, and they can see it in my face. I'm genuinely like apologising or I'm genuinely concerned. Something that happens within the crew, within that bubble of creativity, is kind of like, you know what, tomorrow it'll have gone away, and they, they can just they just deal with that. And I'd rather have that than have somebody screaming down the phone at me saying, the film crew is doing this. It's eleven o'clock at night, uh, and and I can't get my, my kids are awake, and you know they, they can't get to sleep, and all this noise. That's more disturbing to me than a director ringing me up and saying, I'm really not happy with. This location, it's or the wrong what? colour, yellow. Yeah. yeah, I just think you know, you we know, get that. They that. come through City Hall, you they know. look at the corridors and go, It's the wrong colour green. So we've let them paint. <laughs> we've had issues about painting the cells as well, haven't yeah. we? But I, I think it's a really exciting, I want to finish on a high because I think it's a really exciting time to be working in this area and mm. particularly for you mm. guys and what you do. And, uh, and of course, there are female location managers, and we weren't able to get one tonight, but there are. Yeah, I think the growth of TV drama, the increase in TV drama, gosh, there's not a week goes by that we don't get an inquiry for something quite significant. Mm -hmm. And now we're starting, only over the last 12 to 18 months, we're starting to get more and more inquiries from Netflix mm -hmm. and Amazon. And, uh, you know, film purists amongst us may think it's, you know, it's the demise of film and cinema and everything else. I see it as opportunities for people that are studying film and TV for people like yourselves. Do you agree it's a good time to be in yeah, the Yeah, I mean, industry? the thing is, I, I grew up in... I grew up in well, grew up in Bradford 11, uh, not far away from Bradford, but when I came back from university, having done a media degree or whatever, came back to Yorkshire, people not, not, the people were saying to me all the time, you're going to have to go down to London now because that's where the work is. I've ne in 20 years, I've never been further south than Derbyshire. <laughs> <laughs> you know. It was the same, same with me. Yeah. As soon as I got into the industry, people were constantly telling me that you're going to have to go down to London all the works down there. Never, never it, gone anywhere. And they're all coming up here now. Exactly. Yeah. Coming yeah, up it, here. Yeah. Cause, it's cause, true. The London lot are coming up here, yeah. aren't they? To film yeah. all the Yorkshire and the northern locations. So, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I did. ABC Murders had uh, half a week, three days filming down in London. It was a nightmare. Yeah. Trying to get anything done, mm. you have to have at least two weeks mm. advance notice of wanting to book a parking bay. Like everything has to be a, a, pro, a, a, pro, a problem. Yeah. It was, it was a nightmare. Whereas if you compare it to Bradford here, yeah. you could ring you the day before and be like, I've made a mistake. <laughs> yeah. I've forgotten to book somewhere. <laughs> I mean, we could finish on that last, does it always have to be so last minute? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, you see, the thing yeah. is, it's not, it's not, it's not really, it's, it's, it's never, not us, it's them. It's not yeah. us, it's them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, it's kind of, <coughs> that's the whole thing where we're the bridge between the two and it's kind of, like I said about the bubble, it is a bubble because they become, in this creative bubble, they're not really living in the real world <laughs> because they're in this creative environment. Everywhere's a set. And then they'll yes. ring up and say, I think we could change the hours tomorrow to like, you know, film until midnight instead of finishing 8, 8 p.m. I think, well, for one thing, I've PR'd it all up till 8 p.m. I've spoken to hundreds of people. So then I've got to redo all that mm. probably the day before to go and <laughs> film there. I'll say to David, 
we're going to we're going to change the hours. We're open gonna, until the, yeah, yeah, can yeah, you, yeah. yeah, can we can we film there different hours now? Is that okay? I mean, it, it 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 does become unworkable sometimes. That last minute thing. We're used to it now that we'll get a call, and we of course we want to support the the, the good stuff. But the amount of time we will get stuff. I don't think from you guys, because we have a better working relationship, but some people that are so unrealistic, uh, mm. we want to close a road, when do you want to do it, Saturday? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, you can't do that, you know? I think the thing highway. is as well, because, because you do push, you know, do pull out all the stops to make it happen. People take advantage. And the productions, they go, oh, well, they made it happen last time. <laughs> <laughs> we've, yeah. started being a bit more, <laughs> we've started being a bit more firm on that. Would you please give a big hand for our guests tonight, Jamie, Jonathan and Leon.